Hello and welcome to this latest webinar in the e-commerce world review series for March 2024. Uh, on this one we're talking about the UK Growth 1000 report which uh, has been recently published and uh, I'm Paul Skelton, one of the um, analysts at Retail X. Uh, I didn't actually write to this particular report but I have been um, quite heavily involved in covering the, the Growth 1000 for Retail X for a number of years so uh, I'm fronting this one. Uh, I'm going to come to the report uh, shortly and go through some of the key uh, highlights of what it tells us. Uh, and then we're going to have a discussion with uh, Jonathan and Drew, who I'm joined with, um, about what that means for smaller retailers. So, uh, Jonathan, Drew, thanks for joining us. Great to see you. Um, for those watching who aren't familiar with uh, companies, uh, Jonathan from Landmark and Drew from Up, um, maybe just tell us a little bit about uh, what you do. Uh, I'll start with you, Jonathan. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Hi, everybody. I'm Jonathan Matchett. I'm Senior Vice President at Landmark Global UK. And we essentially help e-commerce sellers, brands, retailers with clearance, delivery, shipping uh, to everywhere globally. Hi. Hey. Brilliant stuff. And uh, Drew, tell us a bit about, uh, about Up. Yeah, hi, Paul and everyone. Uh, so Up is a product data platform. We help paid media teams uh, gain control of the machine learning technologies that they're now using across platforms like Google Advertising and Meta. Brilliant, fascinating stuff. Excellent. Well, before we come to uh, picking your uh, collective brains about um, the, the wonderful world of these sort of SMB retailers, I'm going to uh, just go through some of the sort of highlights of the, uh, the, the latest Growth 1000 report. The Growth 1000 report looks at the 1,000 uh, fastest growing e-commerce retailers in the UK that sit outside of the top 500. That sounds horribly convoluted, but essentially there's the top 500 retailers who are the, the sort of main big names that you all know and love. And then we look at the thousands who sit outside of that. So it encompasses quite a few uh, that we have all heard of and know and love, uh, but it also many, many other smaller players who are not household names, but are doing a uh, great sort of trade in um, uh, e-commerce and are doing quite some quite innovative things. And what we do is we uh, index them uh, on, on an index sort of score uh, so that we can compare how the sector is doing or how those thousand retailers are doing year on year so we can compare them with each other uh, and with previous years and that's essentially what the data from the report I'm going to have a look at right now um, is just to give us a sort of overview of what the, the sort of SMB e-commerce retailer landscape in the UK looks like at the moment so um, the Sankey chart here shows really how those companies are broken down. I mean, obviously, there's a massive list in the report. You can see all that. So when you download it, there'll be a link at the end of the webinar. But essentially, as you can see, they're, um, they're largely made up of retailers and brands. There are one or two um, that, uh, that, that, are, that are marketplaces, but essentially, they are retailers and brands. They're largely uh, headquartered in the UK. Um, not entirely. Obviously, there are some that are uh, based overseas, but um, they're typically uh, UK based uh, and as you can see the traffic that uh, comes to them is similarly split um, between retailer and, and brands and the UK HQ'd ones. Uh, typically they cover a vast long tail of sectors. Um, so that's why the other there that you can see on the left in the sector part is, is, is sort of accounts for half, slightly more than half. Um, uh, but really, the, the, the standout ones, there are a sort of notable number in fashion, sport and leisure, homewares and consumer electronics. But there are, of course, literally a thousand that are uh, spread across many of the other sectors. So it is a broad and diverse range of companies and what they sell. So comparing the index uh, that compares their performance, which is largely based uh, around looking at how they service customers, how they uh, do their logistics and delivery, their sustainability uh, and their, their general sort of marketing, etc., uh, gives us a score. Um, I won't go into the details of how the score is worked out. That is explaining quite deep, some detail in the report. It's, it, it's reasonably complex how it's arrived at, but it is comparable company by company, year by year. As you can see, the total index value uh, for our growth 1000 has improved over the years. So uh, these smaller businesses are getting better and better at doing e-commerce and, and satisfying the, the needs, which I think is, is 
interesting because it is quite an established business. It's a cutthroat and very competitive business. And it seems that these smaller companies, despite economic pressures uh, that we've seen in the past few uh, few years, um, they are you know really investing in making things work and, and, and performing better for, for their consumers, which is, you know, heartening. Uh, so where that performance is sort of seen across the sort of average values of the index, um, it's all the spread there is not particularly large. Um, they're all sort of fairly comparable, but uh, jewellery nominally is sort of out in front. But you're sort of seeing these companies like sports and leisure and cosmetics and fashion, uh, in particular, sort of dominating out there in uh, in in the sector, and uh, you know their performance is is you know, markedly good. Uh, the value chain things we look at the customer, the product, the operations as discussed, uh, all tending to sort of converge there uh, into into one. They're all actually equally well performing across those three metrics. So the the time and investment that's gone into improving how these companies perform uh, is quite uniformly across how they interact with their customers and the service they offer, the product and product visibility that they have, and the operations. And I think this is telling in the to be a successful e-commerce business large or small you have to focus on all three you can't just sort of uh, prioritize one over any of the others and we're seeing that i think and that's driven by the sort of the market forces of the the, the the sector so competitive uh the average index value for breaking down the thousand five hundred and fifty top 50 the, the top 50 performing ones obviously um have a have a better index score than the, those in the, the thousand, but still the top one thousand there does have, uh, you know, it's it's nearly a fifth. It's an interesting uh, amount of uh, of good behaviour, as it were. Uh, so it's really sort of showing how those companies are also um, doing very well. The more successful they are, the more they appear to be investing in making this work. Uh, and the results, I think, speak for themselves in terms of the fact that uh, the more you try and do these things, the better your performance, the higher ranked you become, the more you sell. And, and so it's self-perpetuating. I think what's interesting to see is how those companies may change year by year. Again, that's something that's taken account of in the in the full report. And it's too detailed really to go into in this particular webinar. But if you download the report, a lot in there about how that that, that sort of landscape has changed. Uh, so just to look at uh, the specifics of, of the metrics we looked at, um, the first one, the customer, the customer value chain, as it says there, the, uh, these traders that stand out on how they take steps to improve customer experience. Uh, typically, um, to exemplify that, we've pulled out product ratings and user managed lists as two examples of things that help deliver customer value. Um, as we can see there, uh, the growth two thousand, the growth one thousand websites. It's it's growing across that um, particular uptick between sort of uh, August of last year and August of this year. Uh, things have improved, uh, you know, noticeably there in terms of product ratings. I think there's more and more focus on product ratings. Uh, user managed lists slowly growing, but um, almost sort of considered a reasonable sort of standard. Uh, thing that most websites have to have and customers, I think, now expect that to be part of it. Product ratings, uh, more on trends currently. And there uh, you can see some of the uh, leaders in the customer value chain that uh, for that particular sector, uh, there are some names in there that we've heard of, Birkenstock, Boohoo Man, for example, Patagonia, many others that are probably less well known, but these are the companies that are doing this very well. Versace, obviously, we've all heard of. Uh, the product value chain, this is how products uh, are presented, um, particularly how how uh, companies will suggest alternatives and uh, uh, drive sales that way uh, when people are looking for particular things. I think, again, um, it's growing in popularity. There's been a surge in this in the past year or the year between August 22 and August 23, which is the period of the analysis uh, looked at. Uh, again, I think we're seeing uh, uh, it's all part of this growing focus on having to deliver um, a better experience for customers and making, you know, it's, it's got to have, or, you know, you've got to suggest alternative products. That's the way to drive sales. And again, there are the uh, top companies in that uh, part of it again some 
very well known names in there uh, and many that, that aren't so who are doing uh, doing some really great things uh, around the product value chain uh, operations of course the fulfillment delivery all that sort of stuff a crucial uh, part of um, e-commerce and, and often the sort of uh, front end face really for many customers of how well a company performs uh, as we can see there so the same day delivery hasn't really changed across uh, a number of years uh, whereas uh, next day delivery has, has sort of fluctuated. Um, again, it's not as high as perhaps you've seen in the other uh, segments we've looked at. Um, again, it has upticked in the in the past 12 months of the analysis period in terms of next day delivery. I think it's interesting here that sort of delivery isn't maybe necessarily being focused on as much as it perhaps should be, uh, which is something we shall come to when we uh, do uh, the discussion part of the webinar shortly and again there's the list of the top players therein uh the capital value chain this is about investment this is trying to sort of look at uh, sustainability and transparency thereof uh this is a bit different sustainability is increasingly important to um consumers in terms of the choices they make around the retailers they purchase from but it's harder to measure uh, and we haven't done as much on it over the years because it's become sort of more important more recently um but we can see there that sort of uh, it, it's it's sort of low percentages of companies that are publishing sustainable goals and commitments and plan actions and and, uh, and so on uh so it, it's it's and it's declined year on year i think that's you know primarily down to the cost of living crisis uh, in, and inflationary pressures, it, it's become less of an incentive to some retailers if they've got to cut costs somewhere, it, uh, it comes out of that. However, it uh, I think will fluctuate up and down as things pick up and, and improve, it will become more important again. And we see there again, the list of the top companies doing it again, some very well known names uh, within that list. So that's a overview really of some of the key metric findings. There's a lot more data in there about what the companies do. There's a lot of case studies about many of these smaller companies, which paints a very interesting picture of the variety of uh, e-commerce companies uh, operating in the UK and, uh, and gives us sort of in, insight into the variety of ways in which they're trying to drive up customer engagement and sales and all those sorts of things. So that's uh, a whistle stop, like look at, at the metrics. I think sort of uh, what's interesting now is to, to take a look really at what, what happens in the real world. Uh, and that's why I'm going to bring Jonathan and uh, Drew in to sort of talk about some of the areas that they operate in to give us some insight into um, how uh, you know real world SMB retailers are performing. So. Um, there's a wide range of retailers uh, covering all sorts of sectors on the list, and they've all relatively performed well, and their performance is improving. Um, but the, the market's incredibly crowded. Uh, it's incredibly competitive, so they have to work on improvements and, to do this. Uh, where do smaller retailers look for, for growth, Jonathan? I shall throw that to you, for, but particularly like UK growth, and then I guess beyond that, you know, is the only opportunity really overseas. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, it was a super interesting report and I agree completely that it just showed the breadth and diversity of UK retailers, but also brands. And I, I see that as incredibly healthy, that there's no single formula for success. There are lots of formulas. And uh, um, what I saw in the list uh, in apparel, footwear, beauty, some luxury, uh, some 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 DTC brands that really we see that reflected in the uh, sellers that we're shipping for at Landmark Global. You know, so it's a complete the complete range of e-commerce selling opportunities that we see shipping to UK domestic consumers, but also you mentioned it um, cross border. Um, you know, Landmark Global is very much uh, uh, you know uh, about um, shipping globally um, and and you know taking away the barriers uh, to that. But, you know, what I would say is, I mean, the report, again, it just shows the the opportunity that, you know, whilst you know there are challenges out there in the market, I'm sure we're going to come to that later in the discussion. Um, there are still some 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 pretty big markets. The UK is mature. It is crowded, but it's still full of opportunities. And, uh, you know, what I see from some of the retailers on that list, and you know, I've been through some of their 
checkout experiences. I've placed some orders uh, myself in the last couple of weeks, and I can just see the increasing, um, you know, asking for feedback throughout the browsing experience, the checkout experience in particular, uh, and, and just trying to, you know, through 10,000 iterations, improve the whole uh, customer buying experience brand promise. But in terms of markets, you know, the UK is still, we're doing UK inbound. We, we see that as a growth uh, growth area. Um, but, you know, overseas, still tremendous growth from the UK to the US, to Canada. Uh, Landmark Global is really strong to US and Canada. Also Mexico, a whole North America story. But, you know, don't forget Europe as well. Um, Europe, and I'm sure we're going to come on to it, you know, has got trickier, but it's still by proximity, huge markets uh, for UK sellers. You know, Ireland, mainland Europe. And then, you know, lastly, I would say some of the markets overseas that we might have referred to as um, emerging markets, even just a couple of years ago. I'm talking about the GCC countries, you know, Saudi, UAE, um, some of the Far Eastern countries. And we now say, we now refer to them as growth, growth markets. They're just tremendous opportunities for UK brands to sell into uh, those, those regions with health and beauty apparel, really branded British goods. Mm. I mean, yes, all the other sectors below, right. Um, I must admit that the, the markets for uh, fashion and luxury and sportswear and all those sorts of things are uh, the growth appears to be in India, China. Uh, interestingly, you mentioned Mexico because Mexico mm. keeps uh, keeps cropping up as well and uh, the UAE and uh, various other parts of the Middle East. From your experience, are there particular products that are or, or sectors that are attractive to, to say Mexican buyers, or, or is it sort of you know UK sort of brands generally that that are, that are attractive in these new markets? Yeah, I think it's the latter. I mean, it really is. There's you could say on the one hand, there's no rhyme or reason for you know why some consumers overseas want particular brands, particular products, but. It's just looking for the reassurance and the quality that comes with, you know, British goods. That's where, that, that's where the demand is. Um, and, and, you know, Mexico that you mentioned, uh, Mexico, um, you know, really big growth market, a lot of um, uh, uh, consumers with disposable income there versus, versus some years back. And delivery wise, you know, Landmark introduced uh, a new service there um, end of 2023, you know, it's it's DDP, it's fast, it's completely visible, it's tracked. And you no, know, there aren't many options into that market, but it's just a really good way of um, uh, exporting from the UK um, direct to consumer and actually via marketplaces. We're seeing big growth in marketplace to Mexico mm. as well. So you know, don't overlook, um, you know, pretend, you, know you, you might think of them as smaller markets. And sure, compared to the US and Canada, it is, but it just, just forms are just a just a really exciting additional growth opportunity uh, Mexico mm, yeah yeah it's, it's interesting I think a lot of people are put off as well by these newer markets because um it sounds difficult thinking I've never sold anything in Mexico where do I begin uh, same with the UAE or India and all sorts of things so I think that that's um there's a perception challenge that needs to be overcome I think I guess companies like yours make it uh, a lot easier for them to do so um so what's some of the broader challenges that sort of face? I mean, you mentioned Europe. I mean, obviously, we can't really talk about selling into Europe without mentioning the B word. Um, what's that, you know, what impact is Brexit having now on, on uh, what you see as actual real world retailers selling into Europe? I mean, uh, what impact it had and what kind of things can you do to help companies yeah. sell into Europe? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, it seems it seems weird almost, you know, four years on and we're still talking about Brexit. But, you know, uh, January 2020, um, it certainly turned a lot of retailers off from shipping from UK into mainland Europe, into the EU. You know, I'd say Brexit, but also the impact of IOSS. You know, people might be aware of that whole tax regime change that happened in, uh, in the middle of 2021. And that just seemingly put some psychological barriers up in place. No doubt about it, Brexit has increased you know, complexity, red tape into, into Europe, whichever way you want to spin it. But you know, those markets never went away. There are neighbours. They're still really big trading markets. Ireland's the obvious one. You know, for a UK seller, for language reasons, for proximity reasons, almost feels like an extension of UK domestic. We still see uh, tremendous volumes going from, uh, from, from UK into Ireland. But also, you know, just don't overlook Germany, France, Spain, Italy, the really big mainland European markets. And, you know, whether you need help with 
IOS has registration, whether you need help with uh, you know, European VAT returns, uh, Landmark Global can help with those. And we've also partnered um, you know, just in the last uh, uh, you know, a couple of months with um, a solution that gives an indirect IOSS representation into Europe. So you know, if you want to trade to Europe, it's possible and it's not nearly as complex as you might have thought. Mm. I'm beginning to wonder actually whether sort of because it's such a big market, it's so nearby and it, it was always such a sort of central part of many uh, retailers sort of export strategy that despite Brexit, people still want to sell in there. Is that sort of the case? It's sort of, uh, it's got more difficult, but that's not going to stop us. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah, that is fair to say. Um, you know, I'd say that, I mean, there have been some fundamental changes. So what we also saw was in parallel with shipping continuing from UK into, into the EU, we saw some sellers moving inventory across to mainland Europe. You know, so setting up fulfillment centers um, with Landmark Global, with Active Ants, with Radio, with other businesses across Europe, um, that comes with its own complexity. You then got a split inventory. You've got to manage two different inventory holdings. But just for that proximity to the market and just to get around that whole um, export import complication into Europe, we saw that as a trend uh, moving fulfillment to Europe. But I would almost say it's not that it's reversed, but there's just been a renewed interest in. We've got through Brexit. We've got through that whole IOSS tax regime change. Um, you know, let's really energise you know, shipping from UK into Europe. Absolutely brilliant, um, Drew. Thank you for sitting very patiently through that. What you do is 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 very different, uh, and it's much more about sort of, um, I guess. Uh, these businesses getting noticed, being discovered, being found, um, particularly in the sort of AI and machine learning age. Um, how can they sort of improve their profile? How can they get seen? What are some of the things they need to think about uh, in terms of sort of, um, I guess, online advertising is what it essentially comes down to. It's a very competitive market. How do people, how do these smaller businesses get found? How can you help them do that? Sure. So I think you've touched on there previously around globalization. I think the other the other key thing as well is uh, globalization of uh, what we saw a lot of last year is retailers coming to the UK. So you saw a big impact from companies like Timu and Xi'an um, and they caused you know, some really big challenges around things like paid media. We also think you know, in some cases what we saw last year was companies like Timu increasing paid media costs by 85% in some key categories uh, like jewelry and home and garden. Um, I think one of the key challenges for smaller SMB businesses that are in kind of the hyper growth stage is actually how do they get found? If you think about mm. consumer habits, we're pretty much directed by the kind of key platforms. It will be, be through Google that we find web platforms or through a social media platform like Meta, um, advertising on Amazon platforms. So the, the key challenge that we can see across those platforms as well is actually the behaviors that are going on within those platforms. If you look at platforms like Google, um, the the keyword last year was AI, but you've got to actually see what's the impact going on in those bigger businesses. If you look at a platform like Google, a lot of the assessment around retailers is going through data-driven applications and algorithm assessment around things like the quality of your website, the quality of your inventory behavior, things that are brought up in the report around delivery and time structures. All of these things are being actually assessed no longer by human beings or support teams. They're actually being assessed by machine learning technologies. Um, and I think this is one of the key things uh, for any growth retailer to really focus on is things like data quality, meeting the requirements that are laid out in the report around things like uh, next day delivery, uh, given visibility around return processes. Um, I think a lot of the time we still think of this just in the consumer's uh, thought and view of things that the consumers want them, but actually there's a there's a new there's a kind of a new customer for everyone, which are these algorithms. Platforms like Google are assessing the quality of a retailer's experience around things like SEO, their delivery timeframes, their price points. And if you don't meet the standards of a platform like Google, what we see is actually it becoming a real challenge to actually become visible. Um, so the, the key things are making sure that actually not only are you getting these things right for the consumer experience, but you're also getting it right to actually be uh, qualified and validated uh, for platforms like Google. That's fascinating. That's uh, because, yes, I've never looked at it in those terms, having sort of looked at the, the growth 1000 for many years. I've always looked at it in terms of how can you do this for 
better customer experience and customer satisfaction. But actually, what you're saying is that, that yes, you have to do that, but you also have to bear in mind that that's going to have an impact on how Google looks at you. Are, are, the, are, the, are the things that you have to do around that the same for Google as they are for real human customers? Or is there a different set of, of, uh, of criteria for trying to meet the demands of what Google is looking for based on what real customers are looking for? Uh, I definitely think it's good to always focus on the customer. I'm definitely not saying kind of ignore that, but it's definitely understanding. I think the challenge comes and, and what, what we see is like, although we have this huge globalization in some sense, more competitors, the opportunities that Jonathan talked about around uh, being able to sell everywhere, but actually our internet experience is becoming more consolidated. And it's kind of, there are kind of barriers and um, the rules are far more constructed in these environments before than ever before. And I think the thing to recognize is, you know, 10 years ago, a lot of the validation around what a good retailer was and how Google would perceive them or how Meta would perceive them, that there were teams looking at the quality and assessing retailers' websites and support processes. What we've noticed through our assessment is a lot of this is now machine-led, which means that it's it's far more mathematical and far more zero and one assessments. So there is requirements now to actually, it may not always be the best consumer experience, but it, it it's what the algorithm wants. And if the algorithm wants it a certain way, if you don't meet those standards, you're actually not seen. But there's some really basic examples of this. For instance, imagery. Now, imagery on a platform like Google, there are some standard standard requirements that the algorithms want, like, for instance, white backgrounds on any image of a shoppable product. Now, this isn't always great from a consumer point of view when you're trying to describe brand, but we can see from our assessment that if you don't put the product on a white background, you're going to see about 30% less advertising on products because Google's machine learning can't read actually what the product is, and it can't then relate you to searches. So there's things like that where actually the algorithms need certain behaviors so they can validate and understand actually what you're trading even before you get in front of the consumer. So there are some of these kind of gray areas and, and, and sometimes you can see them as frustrating because you do sometimes remove the kind of brand and positioning in these worlds. Um, but you have to kind of do it to en ensure that you get in front of the consumer that you're trying to you're trying to sell to. How difficult is that for, for smaller retailers to do? I mean, because it sounds sort of, you know, quite sophisticated, quite sort of, you know, having to have, you know, all your inventory photographed and then sort of, you know, on a white background and policing all of that. How difficult is that actually to do? To do? Is that not sort of, a, a, a in some ways, a barrier to entry for, for many retailers to actually do this? Or is this something you can help them do? Yeah, so this is exactly why Up was Up was born, was to try and try. Uh, I think the challenge that we noticed is not only are these uh, kind of algorithms here, but the rate of change and the rate of speed, even from even managing uh, Google campaigns and structures, they're machine learning technologies now that need need governance and consistent prompting. And we do find that unfortunately, um, with a growing business in retail, you're not always able to access key information and be able to build teams that can really validate this. Uh, data understanding so up kind of removes that those barriers we have an automated solution that essentially validates inventory behavior it validates uh, your paid media setups uh, validates your data qualities across your entire uh, e-commerce estate and really looks then to automate the process of ensuring that you're meeting the kind of algorithmic health standards that are needed to be successful um, and we've seen for instance with our with our solution that we can take customers from only advertising kind of 20% of their inventory up to kind of 65% or greater um, by allowing the systems to kind of a machine to manage a machine to make sure that the machine gets what it needs to enable uh, Google to do its thing. Interesting. Uh, it's fine. Then the machines take over and we're all there uh, uh, being subjugated. No, that's uh, I'm not going to go down the, uh, the, the, the tried and tested route of AI is going to destroy everything. Uh, no, that's really interesting. I think it's, it's a really... Um, it's a really interesting and often overlooked part of how this works. So that's, that really sort of sheds some really useful light, I think, on, on something we need to look at in more detail in next year's Growth uh, 1000 report, for sure. Uh, one of the sort of metrics you sort of mentioned that, that Google looks at is the fact that sort of delivery um, and delivery speed. And one of the things that as, uh, you saw in one of, one of the slides from the presentation is that uh, it, it, less effort appears to be being made in terms of... Um, 
next day and same day delivery. Um, Jonathan, what, what's the sort of customer sort of value sort of view of, of delivery these days? I mean, I, I would assume it's still like vital. It's the sort of key thing, but, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, it, it, it's, it, it is absolutely central. I mean, it is part of, it's an extension of the brand promise, that whole delivery promise. But I think, you know, in light of the economic context that we're in, um, you know, it's maybe changed from what we might have thought it was you know, a couple of years ago. You know, it's still important, but it doesn't have to be maybe, dare I say, quite as fast as we maybe all thought the market was moving. Um, that's certainly true with cross-border, but also true with domestic. You know, there's a value proposition that the client, um, uh, you know, works through, but also the consumer is, you know, without thinking about it in such a term, um, is also aware of that there's this balance between cost and speed and quality. And, you know, the consumer's, you know, pretty savvy now to understand that delivery is a cost, whether it's charged explicitly as delivery or whether it's wrapped up in the product cost. Uh, and the consumer, you know, what, what we see is increasingly willing to you know, maybe sacrifice a little bit of that speed so long as they've got the reassurance of what that delivery experience is going to be, how fast it's going to be delivered to them, that it's going to be fully tracked and visible throughout, um, but that it's going to be, you know, significantly cheaper as a result of that versus, you know, as fast as humanly possible. You know, that's, that's, that's the change that we've seen. Mm. Does that sort of impact what Google looks for, Drew? I mean, is Google just looking for fast and and uh, furious, or, or does it take into account this sort of subtle shift that maybe it's more about tracking and uh, and, and that side of, of uh, delivery? Yeah, so Google's. I think the other way to think about this as well is um, who are Google competing against? Now, Google are competing against the likes of Amazon, uh, Meta, and those others to to ensure that essentially. When a consumer lands on their on their platforms, they have the best experience possible. Um, so, uh, and from from a Google perspective or Meta, they're pretty sophisticated at understanding what does what does that look like. So, for instance, from our analysis, again, things like uh, Jonathan may be able to comment on this further. Like next day delivery seems far more important in the U.S. than it is over here, especially in kind of key states like New York. Uh, what we see here is it's, it's really about benchmarking the assessment. So, what Google will do is look at okay. The sector and the competitors of, of a category, I don't know, home and garden, for, as an example, uh, what are the standards that are being met there? What is the what is the best in class? There's not always a one fixed rule that our oh, next day delivery will definitely get you high up the ranks. It's actually looking at the entire spectrum of things like, yes, like what's your return rate policy? What um, what type of delivery uh, are you providing? Uh, is, it, is it a cost delivery? Is it a free delivery? So it's kind of it's also a, a moving challenge it's not like a fixed rule if you do this then you're successful it's consistently updating and evolving as more solutions come in play to make uh, the consumer experience better the actual um, criteria is essentially increasing and the acceptance to kind of getting into that top that, that top search means that actually you have to keep pace with the competitors um, uh, no different to things like payment gateways and the expansion that we've had that had there mm -hmm. It's that if you can if you can provide your consumer with one click checkouts and you know, um, pay buy now pay later schemes, these are what all your other competitors are doing, and it's keeping pace with actually not only yourself providing a, and a, providing a better consumer experience, but actually keeping keeping pace with the category you're at, uh, retailing in. So it's sort of relative, I guess. Yeah, because what, what what sort of strikes me as interesting is that sort of, and it's purely anecdotal that, that uh, in my household, online shopping has switched very much to Timo and Shein. Uh, neither of which deliver, I don't think, looking at it, a particularly great sort of user experience on their websites, or indeed in the case of Timo, the delivery is quite slow. But that doesn't seem to be a problem. Is the things like that changing how? Uh, I guess consumers and you know Google Meta those sort of sort of view customer service. Do you think, Jonathan? Yeah, I mean, I think you know that um, a lot of that resonated. Um, you know, Timushi and no doubt have have you know taken big chunks out of the market. But you know, I saw even today, you know, uh, AliExpress was talking about from China to US uh, in in sub five days. Um, so you know, we, we we're thinking in terms of next day same day in domestic markets but you know crossing the globe uh that's um you know another big player you know alibaba aliexpress you know competing with those uh you know two other chinese seller brands 
uh, using delivery speed uh, as a uh, as a lever. And and, and I, I think it's um, you know it, it's about communicating what that delivery speed is, but also offering choice. And you know what I see increasingly um, through the browsing experience, never mind at the checkout now, is really giving the consumer some 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 options there around. Um, around a number of things, but including delivery and the, and, the, and the speed and the provider of that. And, and I, I think that's what we've seen. It's not one single, uh, again, not one single solution, which is, you know, as fast as possible. It's, you know, you can have it at this speed, it's at this price, or you can have it slightly slower and uh, you know, the price is, is, is flexed downwards accordingly. And, and, and Drew, how, how do you think sort of uh, the rise of Timu Sheehan has changed what you do or how retailers sort of uh, get ranked and looked at has it has it had an impact does it change things oh massively it was it was fascinating to watch actually uh we were able to collect data across platforms like google and meta and look at the kind of the sectors and the impact the team we really kicked into life in july of last year and especially we saw it across black friday where um you know you asked about is there rules to get visibility there is one rule you can spend a lot more in advertising and what we did what we did see with the likes of uh teamu is they were increasing the average cost per click in some tech sectors by 180 percent we actually believe from our analysis that they were losing about 30 pounds on every single order they were making through google uh taking a very very aggressive stance on driving and driving traffic and there was actually an interesting report on the, on the bbc today about Know, their goal of just around uh, domination and they're not looking for profit they're looking for higher high rates of high rates of growth the interesting thing around paid media and platforms like team you again when working with some of our customers is actually explaining to them that um you know they might see team you as more of a low end uh, um, in terms of quality of products and everything else but the, the challenge you have is that yes but is it relatable to the search terms when consumers are looking for products you may not think they're a direct competitor because maybe your brand is slightly better. You've got a different experience for your consumer, but are they turning up in the auctions? Because if they're turning up in the auctions, they're driving CPC cost up phenomenally. And that is where a really big challenge comes into play is that you may not think them as a direct competitor, but they, if they are in the auction, they are a direct competitor and they're having a direct impact in your efficiency to media spend where we've really recommended um, customers look and how you should help. And again, part of the up technology is to really look at opportunities and windows where you should advertise, where there are gaps in that sort of problem. How do you advertise more of your inventory at a greater breadth to actually diversify your portfolio of inventory that's being advertised? And that's the way we've seen uh, retailers become successful is you really have to start to take a data-driven approach to this. We saw it hugely with Timu, for instance, in the gifting sector. Um, in Q4 of last year, where they were hugely driving up the cost of advertising. And because of that, you then saw other platforms like Etsy follow them and the smaller retailers follow them. What it actually causes is a huge bow wave of cost inf inflation. Um, and if, if everyone follows it, the, the knock on effect is unfortunately poor profit at the end of the day, which you, you really want to try to avoid, especially in the current economic climate. Mm, yeah, interesting. Um, so with that sort of in mind, what, uh, what do you think we're heading towards? So where, where uh, does the, what, what does the sort of next 12 months have in store, do you think, it, around how smaller retailers operate, the things they should be looking out for, the things they should be doing, um, some of the challenges, some of the solutions? What, uh, what What's the year ahead looking like, Jonathan? Well, I mean... <laughs> Uh, I'm an optimist, you know, ho hopefully it looks pretty good for growth. When I was looking at, um, you know, GFK's uh, Consumer Confidence Index, and you know, it's the highest it's been for two years, but it's still negative, still a negative number. Uh, okay. And you know, in the UK news, we've all seen, you know, inflation's come down. You know, there are some really good signs of you know, growth uh, at the same time as, you know, we're all pretty aware, you know, clients, you know, sellers, as well as consumers, that you know, there's a squeeze on household income and, you uh, um, you know, there's still an still, still an error of caution, but you know we're seeing uh, renewed growth. You know, we see that from our existing clients uh, trading to new markets. Uh, we see it in um, uh, new customers and existing trading through marketplaces. Uh, you know, a couple of a couple were mentioned by by Drew there, but you know we see Landmark Global. Um, you know, quite big growth through you know, Walmart Marketplace, through Wish, through others, and 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 that we see as a lever for just building um complementary um sales channels 
Um, so, so you know, if you're if you're a UK seller, um, there's certainly you know opportunities within the domestic market, but also overseas, new markets, new channels, and you know, I'd say in the next 12 months looks you know, rosier than the last 12. Um, you know, we're seeing you know cautious, but you know, an upward trajectory. Mm, it does seem, seem to be going in the right direction. Uh, Drew, what are your views? What what uh, what changes? Uh, hopefully for the best, uh, we, are we going to see, um, do you think, in the next 12 months? Yeah, like we said, I think consumer confidence is growing, which is, which is great. I think the biggest focus on where we see uh, retailers, large, uh, small, uh, do uh, are where they're successful is, it, is in the planning. And I'd probably say this is one of the biggest challenges, but if done well, uh, has a huge difference especially in the current kind of economic scenarios actually understanding what objectives you're setting uh, understanding actually where where does profit lie really ensuring actually internally you're you're aligned on actual strategy when you go to market across different channels um that i'd probably say is the number one factor that we find with customers um mm. is all well and good having all these automation solutions but actually defining what success looks like um and actually defining actually what you're trying to do in market that, that seems to be the key thing to unlocking success where we've seen customers be really successful is really understand actually what they're trying to achieve uh having a data-driven approach to it to ensuring that they're aligned for success then to be able to deploy it where we see challenges sometimes is where 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 um, commercially retailers aren't quite lined up so should we spend are we trying to drive paid media efficiency are we trying to go for profit are we trying to go for market share what does what does success look like and be able to be re to be reactive in that environment as well as key interesting excellent well i think that's a, a nice upbeat uh point on which to uh, draw things to a close um Jonathan, Drew, thank you ever so much for joining us. Thank you for sharing those really interesting uh, insights. I think there's a lot to take away there and uh, unpack for people listening, uh, particularly those running uh, smaller e-commerce businesses, because I think there, there, there are some challenges. There is some opportunity up ahead. You've given them, I think, some great ideas and some great solutions. So uh, I look forward to more growth in the Growth 1000 next year. Uh, for those of you watching, you can download the report at the link that's on the screen uh, just there. There's a lot more information and detail in the report than uh, I could do justice to in the time in the presentation. So do give it a read. Uh, do feel free to get in touch with any uh, comments and thoughts you have uh, for myself or for Jonathan or for Drew. But other than that, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and for joining us. And thank you, everybody, for watching. And we'll see you again soon. Thank you and goodbye. Thanks very much. Thank you.